this past Friday night, I was here for gallery night, and someone came up to me and said, well, what are you displaying here? And I said, I don't do any displays, I just speak words. And words have been, I want to let you know, one of the things that I've kind of enjoyed from the very beginning. Uh, I think I learned how to read before I was three years old. I enjoy, the reason for my bad eyesight is I read under the pillows and under the blankets with a flashlight. That's the way it is, but I've loved analyzing them, reading them. It's not a good week if, unless I've read four books. I just love words. It's a great thing. And what's fascinating is that this particular story, the Tower of Babel, has great interest to me because it explains how words can either unite people or divide them. Now you'll remember we're looking at this, these 10, 11, 12 chapters of Genesis to kind of introduce the big themes that God has in the Bible. These chapters, the first 12 chapters of Genesis, act almost like a preface for what God's going to do the rest of the Bible. It's kind of like the outline at the very beginning. And so what's suggested here is that what these stories do is they suggest what's going to be filed on later on. They don't give you the full details, but they just kind of help you appreciate it. And in this regard that, regard that, the writer of the book of Genesis, I believe it's Moses, okay? The writer does, he makes a kind of pendulum effect from one high point to a low point in the course of these chapters. You remember, it starts Genesis 1, 2, that God creates all of creation, pronounces it good, man and wife, they're having a great time. And then we go to Genesis 3, and from the great pleasure of creation, we come to its pain. Next chapter. God calls two brothers to worship. High point. He's a God who wants to be center of their life, and one worshiper kills the other one. Great idea. I hope you survive today. You never know what's going to happen to someone next to you in the parking lot. You know, that's the way it works, you see. But from the high point of worshiping, you got murder in the field. From the high point of knowing how to follow God, you have Enoch, who we looked at the text, walked with God 365 years, a year for every day. And then after that, you have the low point of God's observation that nobody seems to be getting it right. The only person who comes to the high point is Noah. And he does this stupendous thing. He obeys God's word, builds an ark, saves the world. It's a high point. And then we come to the next low point. Follow on where I read. This is Genesis chapter 11. We'll read the first nine verses. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found the plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, as if one people, as if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan will, to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, the real question behind this text is fascinating. It's not just so much what the text says, but what its purpose is within the greater narrative of what Moses is writing here. And you understand that what really is going on is he wants to explain what's God at work doing. And we've also used this other kind of lens to look at this text. We've said, among other things, that Moses is leading this newly liberated group of slaves out of Egypt, and he's trying to give them some cues as to how they should live together. So this story fits in an amazing way to help the greater purposes of God, not just at that time, but for all time. You have a copy in your hand of the outline. You don't have the praise and prayer sheet because we had problems with the printer. You understand? But at least you got it, okay? And you recognize that I've done my thing, but I've added something. Instead of three points, I got four. I know it's confusing to all of you to go from three to four, but I, I trust you're flexible. That's how this works. But there are three huge points that God wants his people to know. 
First, he wants them to know the setting, verses 1 and 2. And they give some cues as to the way language is supposed to work. Second, the story explains their sin. What's hinted at in the first couple verses is more detailed in the second two. And how the purpose of languages is and, and continues to be perverted. They use language to make a city, a tower, and a name, it says in the text. Thirdly, this story gives us hints as to God's strategy. What God is about and why. The last several verses that we read. And then finally, at the end, I kind of want to back away from this to understand the significance of this story as a kind of introduction to the great plan of God that's going to work its way across the whole of the Bible, even into our time and beyond. First of all, this issue of setting. Verses 1 and 2 talk about the purpose of communication. And there are two introductory cues that foreshadow the events that will take place later in the story. The first is that it says centuries after the flood and after Noah has kind of saved people, people have recreated, procreated, and such. It says that they were of one language, one tongue. And what's being understood is that the plan of God for words were always to connect people, not just to each other, but to him. You'll remember, if you studied with us, that in Genesis 1 and 2, God comes to the, 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 our, our forebearers in the Garden of Eden, and he comes in the cool of the day. It's a Middle Eastern metaphor. God could have come any part of the day, but that's the time when things are cooled down. And his purpose of coming into the Eden was to walk with Adam and Eve in order to talk to them. The idea being that the words that God gave, the language that he gave to them and to those following is to help them to communicate. Community is based on communication. Speech is the key for that. But as time goes on, it quickly becomes evident that the introduction of evil changes the purpose of words. And words, instead of being means of communication, become weapons. You all know that, correct? In fact, when called out on it, the man and the woman cart blaming each other and blaming God. You know the old phrase, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Untrue. Amen? In fact, some of you know the pain that lingers even to this day of somebody, baby parents, whatever, said something bad and you still can hear the sting of it. So words become not means of healing, but means of hurt. And we'll quickly see that this common language is used to serve other purposes than what we're originally created to have and to do and to use. Now, if that's true historically, it's true experientially. Words quickly can become perverted to create discord. Know what the earlier ancestors did. They moved to one location. They sort of, they got themselves together and got in this Tigris-Euphrates plain and the plains of Shinar, which becomes kind of the uh, introductory place for some of the early principal cities of the fourth millennia BC. The text presents these decisions of the descendants of Noah in value neutral places. He's basically saying, this is what they did. But if you're reading alongside, you're saying, uh-uh, 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 that's not what they should have done. Why? Because the mandate of God to Adam and Eve and the rest of them was to fill, expand, and explore the earth. Not to settle in one place. And all of a sudden, you're reading along the Genesis narrative. You're saying, uh-oh, uh-oh. And you're meant to feel that stuff. The text presents the decisions as kind of the beginning of a slippery slope where our forebearers are doing something that they weren't created to do. Can I ask you and ask me the same question? Have you made where you settle the principal place or the person that you're talking to, i.e. God, the principal place? Have you settled in such a way that you're no longer connected to the God who made you? You see, behind all this, there's a fundamental theological truth. The God we worship, the God we've been singing of and to, is a missionary God. He's a God who has concerns for the whole world, not just our little place in it. So even if we're here in southeastern Connecticut, we ought to be interested in what God's doing in other places and other people. Our team has just returned from Haiti. 
The reason we send teams to Haiti is not just to help them, but to help us. Understand that God is doing good things in all parts of the world. And I hope you hear and have conversation with some of the folk who have spent the last week with our brothers and sisters in that place because what it does is it helps you see the bigness of the God that we serve. We're in the process of providing food for folk who are more, less fortunate than we are. The reason for the Thanksgiving baskets is so that we don't take God's blessing in our places as the only place where we can ex have it and extend it. I'm understanding this year from Dave and Karen Krug that instead of 30 to 35 baskets, our culture and our setting is in such need that we're now anticipating 45 baskets this year, hence the need for turkeys. I told them, piece of cake. There are 700 turkeys that come to this church any Sunday anyway. You know, we can certainly come up with 45. Yeah, you know how this works, you know. I mean, I are being the chief of the turkeys. You know this. I mean, I'm paraphrasing Paul. You know how this works, okay. Thirdly, the reason we care for the kids at Christmas is because we need to take care of just not our own children. And so you'll find out the appeal to care for those who are in Fort. Why? Because we serve a missionary God and we ought not to use the settling mechanism that so easily pervades us, looking out for me and mine, and forget that God's concerned about the whole world. So the story begins with this people coming together in the Shinar Plain. And the briefest of statements were given an outline of their sin, verses 3 and 4. The reason why they sin is because they use an alternative organizing principle for their community instead of God. And they do that by means of two institutions that are related and a justifying ideology. The first thing they do is they build a city. They don't want to be scattered, they want to be urbanized. And the city will become the thing that ultimately brings their community together. Now, huge point here. If you forget everything else, remember the next point. In the ancient world of the fourth millennia BC, people did not live in the city. Try it one more time. In the 4,000 years before Jesus comes to this planet, cities were made not for people, but for towers. <laughs> In fact, the folk who lived in the city were the priests who did the ideology to represent the people to God. The people lived outside the city in the plains around. The cities were made not for the people, but for the purpose of connecting via the priests with God. The determination to build a city while it moved toward urbanization, where ultimately people would be located in, you'll recognize if you've done any of the archaeological stuff, there's kind of the, the old city, and then there's the cities where the walls get extended. The reason for that is the initial cities were made to house the temple complex, and ultimately to create a kind of hierarchy of priests who represented the people before God. Within the cities, they built this tower for connection, and it was ultimately a temple complex. And it had three purposes. The first was from safety from floods, because the diluvial plain periodically would flood. In fact, in 1967, this same area experienced a flood. It's fascinating that what we tend to think is mostly uh, uh, you know, kind of lowlands and sand, you can see by the progression of pictures show how much it happened. Hundreds of miles in this area were under the influence of a flood. Some cases just a couple feet, sometimes many. It diluted the whole area. You'll watch how it happens. First of all, it gets a little bit larger, a little bit larger, a little bit larger, and pretty soon it extends to hundreds of square miles. The people's built the city and the tower to protect the priests from the floods. Safety being the big issue. The purpose behind this is not just for safety, but for the security of the priestly class. The suggestion here is that the priestly caste have placed themselves above the people and have designed a religious complex that can be defended against assault. The particular pictures you've seen can easily be defended because only one or two or three places have access into it. Small band of guards can keep the folks from storming the city and its gates and the temple complex. Finally, 
This particular tower becomes the means by which spirituality is practiced. It's on the top of the tower that a little room is created with a bed and fresh food each day. And the ziggurats is what the technical term allows the priests of this to be able to do their religious observance. Now note carefully, the tower is not made for the people, it's made for the gods. And in so doing, two things take place that are heinous, that are opposite the intention of God. The first is that the gods start to become humanized. They come down from the heavens. They have to lie down in the bed that's provided. They need to eat the food that's given. And secondly, the gods come to a particular place so that the people, the priests, are proclaiming this kind of belief system that you want the gods to be in a place where you know they're going to be, as opposed to the god of Genesis who's everywhere. And he's the god who blesses and provides all that we need. We don't have to provide anything for him. And whenever a group of people, whenever a group of people who profess to know God try to localize him and make him human, They've blown it because our God's much bigger than that. Amen and amen. Hence, the sin and the question that flows out of it. Where do you go to meet God? Periodically, we come to places like this so that we can come into the presence of God as a collected people. But the purpose of coming here is just to recalibrate our instrumentation so that we'll be able to hear and talk to him in all the other places of our lives. Friday night, I was talking to one of the artists, well, name, named uh, unnamed. And she came to me and she said, well, wow, today was a great day. I actually was talking to God. Well, I'm one of these cynics at heart. And I said to her, well, who did most of the talking, you or God? She says, well, that's the amazing thing. I got myself quiet enough that he actually talked back to me. That's the point. You meet God with his people on places like this, but you prepare to meet him wherever you be. He's not in one place, one tower, one city. One th and whenever we seek to localize God, we diminish his character, his scope. Now, why do they do this? Well, thirdly, they want to build a name for themselves, a name for continuity. They don't want to fulfill the creation mandate is to expand and explore and connect to the rest of the world. They want to have something that they've created for themselves. And their legacy is something prompted by their actions, which of course leads to the obvious question I've asked myself, what's my legacy? What, for what do I want to be remembered? How about you? Do I want to be remembered for the name God gives me or the one I seek to build for myself? It happens all too easy. The stuff that became fun becomes drudgery. The encouragement we have in walking with Jesus starts to become a duty. You've probably seen it, but a bunch of years ago, maybe 15 years ago, there was a great Disney film called The Rookie. Maybe you've seen it. It's a baseball film. I encourage you to look at it. It's based on a true story of a high school teacher whose arm healed, and while he washed out of double-A ball when he was a kid, now he's in his 30s, and he all of a sudden realized, finds out that he can pitch pretty fast. So he leads his Texas team to the class quintuple-A championships because he teaches the kids how to pitch against fastballs where he's throwing at 98 miles an hour. You can imagine a high school team hitting 98 mile an hour fastballs, all the rest of the competition's easy. So they make a deal with the guy. If we win the championships, you go for a tryout. And he ultimately is selected. The point of the story is this. Going through the rigors of minor league ball to get to the major leagues is a drudgery. And pretty soon it gets old. And the hero of the rookie realizes one night while he's kind of worried about being away from home, family, and kids, he looks over the fence of his double-A ballpark and he sees a group of kids playing Little League ball, and they're doing it for the joy of the game. You know, the point is this. Sometimes we make a duty out of connection with God. We make religion into something we have to do as opposed to something we get 
to do. Friends, you don't come here because you have to. You come here because you get to. And we speak to the Lord of the universe. We sing his praise, not out of duty, but out of joy. How will God help these people in the midst of this work upon work to make a name for themselves? Well, God has a strategy. It's found in the rest of our story. He comes down and he confuses their language. And there's a kind of uh, preventative medicine argument here. God looks down and sees what's going on. And so his ultimately plan at this point is to address the problem. He anticipates what might happen and it prompts him to prevent it from happening. Where pre-flood evil resulted in wholesale restart under Noah. God says this point, we can't let that happen again. So we're not going to allow them to use language for wrong purposes. So he confuses their language. And ultimately, he's got a plan for them. The plan is to do what the creation mandate was supposed to be in their minds. He scatters them across the entire world. And they, what they feared takes place because all of a sudden they can't communicate. I don't know if it's happened to you, but sometimes I've traveled. A couple times it was in the, in, in the nation of Haiti. And because I don't speak French and I don't speak Creole, there's a frustration that's getting. And you see the confusion of language, among other things, is to make you dependent. Not only on each other, but on God. And the arrogance of the folk in Babel is reduced by the, the, the plan of God. So Babel in God's greater plan is to help us understand that God's got a plan for our lives. Now let me back away and make just a couple more general points about the significance of the story. God's actions have a result, and there's a greater strategy. It's kind of divide and conquer, preemptive strike sort of stuff. God has given us language so that we would ultimately be able to communicate with each other and with him. And when we fail to use language the right way, he divides us even by the very words we speak. The purpose being so that we'll realize we need his help. Oh Lord, I'm speaking to my spouse, I'm speaking to my kids, I'm speaking to my neighbors. Would you use my words because I can't connect with them? And would you take the meager effort, efforts on my part to communicate with them? There's a redemptive analogy at work here. In the text, it says that men moved eastward. And throughout the rest of the Bible, the move east is always, to a, uh, is always a kind of metaphor for a move toward people who are depending on themselves instead of depending on God. It's just the geography of things. And what's being said here, and what Moses is saying to his people, is that the way of blessing is to make God the center of your community, not your quest for significance or for achievement. The Tower of Babel ultimately becomes known as the city of Babylon. And in it, God repeatedly, over the course of generations, even of millennia, tries to help people see that Babylon, even in his greatness, does not have God at its center. Don't be wowed by what you see. Be wowed by who you know that you can't see. And these huge ideas taken from this respond to the way in which God wants us to see what's happening. Within them, there's a promise. And the promise is that God's going to do something to bring people who are dispersed by different languages back together. It's prophesied in, in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. He writes these words, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. You understand what's being promised here? At one point, God's going to come back, and he's going to make it such that people from all different languages will be able to speak not only to each other, but to me with one accord. How's that going to happen? Well, Luke appreciates it when he talks about what takes place at Pentecost. And you remember at Pentecost, uh, the Spirit of God comes down on the people, and they're talking about Jesus. And, they, and, and, and it, it's recorded this way, Luke, Acts 2, verses uh, 6 to 11. It, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. 
because each one of them heard him or heard them, Peter being the spokesman, speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, they asked, are not all these men speaking Galileans who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each one of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Do you understand what's being said here? What's being said is that the, when you talk about Jesus as the word of God, he, all of a sudden God allows it possible in a miraculous way to everybody here. Now, by the way, we're not supposed to take this as a point that you don't need to study another language when you're doing missions. But the principle that's being suggested here is that God's concern is one day to bring people back together because they will be surrounded not by their own efforts, but by putting Jesus as central in their life. Of course, it comes to full-blown. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. John sees this vision of what's going to happen. It says they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain. Talking about Jesus. And with your blood you purchased for God persons, wait for it, from every tribe, language, people, nation. Even people who live in southeastern Connecticut can utter the praises of Jesus. Let me conclude and then we'll uh, invite you to do this. Recently, in my computer, I've gotten a new operating system. We're kind of an Apple sort of family around here, figuring that that was the fruit in the Garden of Eden. It ought to be the, no, I'm just, you know, how that works. You know. Bad, 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 okay. But it's an interesting thing that happens, and I'm not really a super technical guy, but I really enjoy this one. And that is that you can do, a, save a file to a thing called iCloud Drive. And if you set up your thing, if you're typing along in your laptop, all of a sudden, it's going to get changed in my iPad. And if it gets changed in my iPad and I set it up, it also can get changed in my phone. And if I have a brilliant idea in the middle of the night, take my phone out, touch the thing, all of a sudden, it's going to change in the iPad and in the laptop. At the, you know, just instantaneously, like that. The program allows the three different things to communicate with each other. Isn't that cool? Oh, friends, that's nothing compared to what God's doing. You see, God wants to be the center of not only our lives personally, but our lives plurally. <laughs> and when that happens, we not only can communicate with each other, but we can communicate with him. Amen and amen and amen. <laughs> and the way God wants to be center of our purpose and of our people is by making Jesus the word of God made flesh and made in bodily form represented by his body. You know, I just can't wait for heaven. Someone asked at the end of the first service, what are we going to sing in heaven? What are we going to speak? Are we going to speak Hebrew? I have no clue. I'm learning King James English just in case it's that. No, it's a, a, a joke, okay. I'm saying among other things, friends, but one day, we anticipate that God will bring his people together and will speak across culture, tribe, tongue, and even across time and will be united by the fact that Jesus, as the word of God, came to us. Have you heard him speak to you? <laughs> will you speak about him to those who haven't heard him yet? I'm going to pray. Then I'm going to invite you to stand up and sing the doxology a cappella, making God the center of our life. Let's pray together. Now, Lord, would you take the lesson of Babel and help us not to repeat its mistakes, but to put you center in our life. Help us not to put our trust in ourself, our own technologies, our own resources. But help us to believe that you want to be and can be the organizing principle of our life. 
don't know where this fits with the folk here. I know how you're wrestling with it in my life. Would you help us to invite Jesus to be front and center in all that we say and do? And as a result of it, Lord, would you take our words, not only to each other and to others outside this room, take those words and make them agents of your healing and saving grace. For I pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people will say,